Okay. Now, as Job experiences this intense, prolonged physical suffering that has been inflicted on him by Satan, three friends come to him to express their sympathy and to comfort him. And they're Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. Now, as I stressed last week, I said it more than once and will say it uh, more times than this, Job and his three friends, they agree that a just God governs the world according to what Tremper Longman and others label a strict or absolutist retributive justice. In other words, they all share this perspective. This was their common theology. They share this perspective that a just God brings in this life suffering and hardship on all the unrighteous and only on the unrighteous and pours out blessings and abundance on all the righteous and only on the righteous. Now, as readers of the book of Job, we learn that that's not true. That sets up a false dichotomy. God can have just reasons, morally sufficient reasons for allowing exceptions to that principle. For sometimes allowing the righteous to suffer and the unrighteous to prosper. The problem for us is that he rarely makes known what those reasons are. As he does not make known to Job why he's allowing him to suffer so terribly. We're privy to it, but Job isn't. As readers, we know, we're let in on it. We know that God has elected Job to serve as humanity's champion in a great spiritual contest. He's chosen Job to put the lie to Satan's accusation that when it comes to devotion to God, humans are all, at bottom, self-serving frauds. So Job has the unimaginable honor of representing before all the heavenly beings God's position versus that of Satan. But all, know, all Job knows, all he knows is that he's righteous and is suffering severely for a long time for no apparent reason. Now, because they are convinced that a just God brings in this life suffering and hardship on all the unrighteous and only on the unrighteous and pours out blessings and abundance on all the righteous and only on the righteous. Because they're convinced of that, the three friends, they conclude from the extent and duration of Job's suffering that Job is an exceptional sinner. Right? They say, listen, this is how we are convinced God, a just God, works in this world. We are convinced the God we worship is just. You are suffering horribly, therefore, you are an exceptional sinner. Now, the fact that Job appears, from everything they can tell, he appears to be righteous, and we know he is in fact righteous, not meaning sinless, okay? But he appears to be righteous. Well, then they conclude, does that challenge them? No, no, no. They just say, well, then he's sinning in secret. You see, he's hiding his sin. But what we know from the fact he's suffering the way he is, he's an exceptional sinner. In fact, we don't see it. I don't care. He's hiding it. And see, so that's what they conclude. And their solution is for Job to finally confess the sin he's hiding and to repent. And then all would be right with him. Now, Job, on the other hand, right, Job knows, as we do as readers of the book, 
that Job is in fact genuinely devout. He is a truly pious person. But like his friends, sharing their theology, being convinced that a just God brings in this life, suffering and hardship on all the unrighteous and only on the, un only on the unrighteous and pours out blessings and abundance on all the righteous and only on the righteous, well, he then concludes that God is unjust. A just God works this way. I'm righteous and I'm getting the hammer, so my conclusion is God is not just. His friend's conclusion is, Job, you're a liar. Of course God is just and you're simply concealing your sin. So do you see how the shared theology breaks out into the false dichotomy? You see, because they share this mistaken perspective and won't come off it, they reach differing conclusions, both of which are wrong. Now, as Job breaks the silence, after he breaks the silence by complaining bitterly about his situation, venting his deepest feelings and thoughts that are squeezed out of him by his torment. They're just squeezed out of him. Well, then the three friends, they feel like they have to respond. They have to say something. If for no other reason, for Job's own good. And Eliphaz is the first to speak. And he says in so many words, as we saw last week, that Job is getting the hammer because his sin deserves it. That's how God rolls. That's why he's getting the hammer. And he advises Job to repent, and then everything would be well. If he'd simply repent, that'll be good. And he ends his speech by assuring Job that what he's just told him, the advice that he's laid out there, that that's the solid result of much inquiry. That's, that's really been vetted. That's the solid result of much investigation. And that he needs to heed what he's told him for his own good. And then Job responds beginning in chapter 6. And that's where I want to pick back up. So Job says, as I mentioned last week, that, it, that if his anguish and misery could be placed on a scale, they would outweigh all the sands of the seashore. And he says that's why he spoke without restraint. That's what pushed these kinds of things out of him. His agony produced it. You see, it's easy to think about somebody and judge somebody when you're not suffering. You're not in the vice. You're not in the fire. Job was in the fire and he said these things, that's what was, was forced out of him. It was because of the magnitude of his suffering. See, in his mind, God is at war with him. God, for some reason, Job cannot comprehend, has made Job his enemy. And he has made it his business to torment Job. And so that's how Job feels. And he says, Job says it should come as no surprise that he brays like a donkey and bellows like an ox. After all, the donkey and the ox, they do so, they bray and they bellow when they lack food. And Job analogously is lacking any sustenance from life. All that life is presently serving Job is tasteless and inedible. Experiences that are sickening and repulsive. He longs for God to resolve, to finish him off, to put him out of his misery. Now he doesn't consider as much as he's suffering, he doesn't consider taking his own life as that would be a betrayal of God. Now, it seems to me that in our society, we've gotten to the point of, of basically making heroes out of people who kill themselves. We talk about how courageous they are and all that. Listen, I have sympathy for people who are suffering. And I feel sorry for someone who's suffering, but it is sinful to take your own life. And Job is here saying that I don't consider that. He wants God to finish the job. And he says, if God would take his life, then he would have the comfort or consolation 
of knowing that despite his unsparing pain that he would not deny the words of the Holy One. In other words, if God would go ahead and finish him off, if God would take his life, he would die without having betrayed God. And that's what he would like to do. Now this, of course, his saying this, if God would finish me off, I would die without having betrayed him. Well, that grates on his three friends, right? Because his three friends are convinced, you're sinning. You're just hiding it. And now you're talking about, oh, if I was just finished off, then I'd die without having betrayed him. No, you are betraying him. That's why you're suffering. So you see how this would, this would grate on them. Now Job says he has no strength to hold out. No hope of restoration to inspire him to make plans for his future life. He has no strength like that of stones or bronze that would allow him to resist the pummeling that he's taking. And he has no one to help him. To his resolve, his inner strength has been driven from him. It has been beaten out of him. As Longman says in his commentary, Job is in a deep fix, but he sees no way out. And in verses 14 to 23, Job accuses his three friends of disloyalty to him which ultimately is disloyalty to God because God expects friends to be loyal. And by loyalty, it's hesed in Hebrew. He means the type of love that God typically shows his people, love that issues in protection and help in times of trouble. And from Job's perspective, they're attacking him rather than protecting him. They are intensifying rather than minimizing his suffering. And thus they're not showing a proper attitude of fear toward God. You see, because they are not exhibiting loyalty to him. They are beating him when he's down. And so he says that they're not giving a proper attitude of fear to God. Now he compares them to a stream in which one was, one was confident would provide refreshment. One sure that this area, well, I got this big stream here, so I'm sure that that's going to be a source of refreshment when I need it. But when they did need it, it turned out to be dry. And see, the shame and the disappointment that overconfident travelers felt when realizing the stream was dry, right? No, no, we're going to take this trip and I would know, okay, we'll get water here. And just overconfident. So that's where the shame is, you see, because they lacked foresight. They revealed themselves to be foolish. So they have this shame and disappointment when they need the water and it turns up dry. And that's what Job is saying they're like. My friends... You see, I I'm, was overconfident in you, in you, and I'm ashamed of that. Because here I had that, and what did you turn out in my time of need? You're like that dry stream, baby. You're like that dry stream. He says that, he says that when they saw his condition, they were afraid. When they saw, they, they recognized, they look at him, man, this guy's. Well, they were afraid, you see, that he might expect something from them. They're afraid of saying, oh, he's going to want us to give him some money. You see, or he's going to want us to intervene on his behalf with some foe. But Job expected from them nothing but loyalty, which in his case did not require them to give him anything or to intervene with a foe. But they were afraid of that, Job says. You see, that's what you're doing when you saw me. You were afraid of that. Now, Job calls on the friends to help him understand what he's done wrong, as Eliphaz alleged, right? Eliphaz is going to be the first of them. They're, they're going to repeat these themes. That's what I tell you. You're going to see how these things just get over and over to the point of tedium. 
Just little variations of the same cases get made. But Eliphaz has said to him, look, Eliphaz is charging with sin. Come on, man. You know that you're not getting the hammer like this if, if you're not a closet sinner, not just a run-of-the-mill sinner. For this kind of suffering, for this long, that's a clear indication that you got some real stuff going on. Okay, so Job sits here and he calls on them to help him understand, well, what have I done wrong? I mean, Eliphaz is saying I'm doing something wrong. What is it? And he rebukes them for words they think are so virtuous, but which in reality are painful, and they fail to make the case that he's done anything wrong. They fail to actually reprove him. They blow off his words, right? That's what they do. He says, can you reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? That's how you're treating what I'm saying to you. You're just blowing it off. You're treating it here like, like this, the words of somebody who's suffering just like wind. So you do that, you, you treat the complaint of a despairing man that his suffering is not right. I am telling you, Job says, listen, I'm telling you, look at me, I'm telling you, I am a virtuous person and I'm suffering unjustly. Okay, I'm not what you think, getting what I deserve because I'm an exceptional sinner. But he says that, and because they blow off, don't even take seriously, don't even think about whether there could be merit to what Job is saying. Because they treat the words of a despairing man that way, well, that suggests that they're the type of people who would take advantage of an orphan and sell out a friend. So he groups them that way because of how they're reacting to him. But despite their failure, he's willing to give them another chance. See, he urges them to question him, to interrogate him, to investigate his sense of innocence. Find out why I'm saying this to you. Don't simply say, well, he's saying that, but that's got to be a lie. Open up your mind to see if what I'm saying is right. Investigate it rather than simply assume that I'm suffering because I'm sinful. So he'll tell them the truth, he says. I won't lie to you. I'll tell you the truth. And he indicates by the rhetorical question of verse, of verse 30 that he is able to know the true nature of of his calamity in the sense of being able to know that his calamity is not due to his sin. As I, the way I put it is because he lives in here. You see, so he's able to know that, that what's happening to him is not because he's some great sinner. But the parties are going to continue. You see, because they are locked into their theological system, they're going to continue to frame the wisdom battle in terms of this false dichotomy that perks out from their shared theological perspective. They're going to continue to say, Job is sinful or God is wrong. Those are the only choices. Job's sinful or God is unjust? God is wrong. And they're going to continue to do that. And that is spawned, as I say, by their absolutist re retribution theology. Now in chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, Job speaks in utter despair of the suffering, the futility, and the brevity of his life. His nights are torture. Right, his nights are torture, and he's like a walking corpse, complete with flesh, covered with sores, worms, and dirt. This guy looks like a zombie. Okay? A zombie apocalypse, that's what this guy looks like. He's being completely ravaged by what Satan 
has inflicted on him. And because of his dire and hopeless situation, he says in verse 11 of chapter 7, he says that he's not going to restrain himself, but he's going to speak in the full bitterness of his soul. He's going to let it all hang out. Okay, he's going to let it all hang out. And he then accuses God of having him on lockdown. Having him on lockdown as if he were some great hostile force. Like the sea. Or a sea monster. And he accuses God of terrorizing him. And making his life miserable. And he complains that God will not look away from him for a moment. He won't give him a breather. He won't give him a break. He just keeps focused on him and beating him to death. Now that's suffering. But that's how Job feels. He won't give Job a moment of peace or relief. And Job ends this round of his words by declaring in verse 20, through rhetorical questions, that regardless of whether he sinned, and Job knows that he sinned, it cannot warrant, it cannot warrant the level of punishing attention that God is devoting to him. And he asks in chapter 7, verse 21, why God doesn't simply forgive him. See, rather than subject him to such extreme suffering, the implication being that God is bent on punishing him. That's how he feels. He has, for whatever reason, picked me out of the crowd and decided to torture me. That's how Job feels. God has it in for me is his sense. And Job ends by declaring that he will soon be dead and gone. Now, Bildad, he takes his turn. And Bildad opens up by suggesting that Job really needs to shut up. <laughs> you see, Job, he really needs to stop this kind of talk that he's putting out there. He accuses Job of being a forceful blowhard. See, one who speaks with passion and volume, but whose words have no substance. It's just junk. A lot of people like that. Amen. You see, he's just talking, but there's no, there's no substance to what he's saying. And he insists Job is wrong in claiming that he does not deserve what has befallen him because in his absolutist retribution theology, right? The wicked always suffer and the good are always rewarded. Well, in that pers from that perspective, if Job is innocent, then God is being unjust or unrighteous as Job says, right? But because of his, he says, look, if that's true, then God is being unjust, which he knows can't be true. Right now, Job is willing to make the accusation because he lives in here and he knows that, in fact, I am a righteous person. So he's willing to level that grave accusation against God because his theology has trapped him into this missing the reality. But these other guys, because they aren't in here, they just think Job's lying. He's lying. Right? And so that's where, so on that same basis, he even suggests, you see here, he even suggests that Job's children died for their sins. Now, can you imagine me and Job sitting here listening to this? He, I mean, Job, like I said, he's just been beaten to a pulp. He looks like a zombie, suffering incredibly, can't sleep, can't do anything. And then your buddies are telling you, by the way, you know when all your kids died? They died because they were all such great sinners. That's what they needed. Yeah, see, this is what Job is putting up with. Now, because Job knows he's innocent, he at least knows that his three friends are wrong in attributing all suffering to God's specific punishment or discipline for acts of sin. 
but because he is likewise entranced by this retribution theology. And being in the throes of torment, he then is led to charge God with injustice. Now, he's not right in doing that. He's not right in doing that. But as will ultimately be made clear. Now listen, I want you to see what uh, this point. I'll talk about it more when we get to it. But as ultimately will be made clear, a false accusation by one without affliction. A false accusation by one who is not presently suffering. A false accusation by such a person that God governs the world according to an absolutist retributive justice. That false allegation is more offensive to God than a false allegation by a righteous sufferer that God is unjust. That's that's pretty significant. So these, the, the friends here, they're footloose. They're not under the hammer. And for them to make that false charge that God governs the world according to this absolutist retributive justice, we will see God views that as more offensive than Job's false charge that he is unjust. You see, Job's situation, at least Job is honestly assessing the facts. Right? He's honestly looking at, I'm innocent and I'm suffering. And he's trying to make sense of it. He's trying to put them together and make some kind of sense of it, albeit from within his mistaken theological understanding. Whereas his friends... His friends, they are closing their minds to the facts. They simply won't consider whether Job's innocent. They won't, they, they won't entertain any evidence, anything. They won't interrogate him. They won't do anything. They simply start from their theological assumption. We already know the answer. And we don't need to investigate anything. We don't need to invest. They won't be an honest seeker. And in doing that, and so they're they're pushed to that because of their their view of, you know, their theological perspective. Now, Job at least allows his theology to be challenged by facts, but in his pain he reaches the wrong conclusion. Whereas the friends, right, in in their hubris, they won't consider any challenge to their theology. They will not sit here and say, well, I'm, I'm invested in this theological perspective, and if I conclude that Job is in fact innocent, well, I'm going to have to do a rework. And I'm not doing any reworks because I already know for sure that I'm right. And so therefore, any evidence that Job is in fact innocent, I don't care about. I am in fact going to blow it off. I'm going to treat what he says as wind. And this is not good from God's perspective. He doesn't, he doesn't appreciate that. You see, the person who's acting in extremist, the person who is getting the hammer, he speaks falsely about God, but he at least maintains his integrity by saying, listen, I know that I am a relatively righteous, pious, devout person, and I'm not going to say otherwise, I don't care how much you bully me into it. So he at least, you see, maintains his integrity and in that he encourages other people to maintain their integrity. But the one acting from calm reflection, see, that person, he burdens the sufferer with a lie and he pulls pulls the sufferer toward a dishonest assessment of his life. He's trying to bully him into lying. You see, so I'm trying to give you some rationale for why do I think the one would be more offensive to God? They're both wrong, but as we'll see, God is more offended by the other. Now, in chapter 5, verses uh, 5 through 7 of chapter 8, Bildad, he assures Job 
that God will restore him if he repents. Look, just listen to what I'm saying. Confess whatever it is you're hiding. Turn from it. And you'll be good to go. Why don't you just do that? Now, of course, again, as readers, we know that Job is not suffering for his sin. That's why that was settled at the beginning. So we, we read with the understanding. So that's a false prescription that is being given. A false prescription. Bildad wrongly assumes that suffering necessarily is a sign of sin. And that is false. False, right? Now, Bildad appeals to the tradition in, in chapter 8, verses 8 to 22, to the tradition of prior generations. What other wisdom teachers that they had access to, what they had thought and how they had conceived things. So he appeals to that. And those who forget God, he says, wither and perish like a reed without water. So assuming, see, Job, you're forgetting God. Right? That's what's happening to you. Just like, you know, just like the reed is perishing without water. And they put their confidence in something that can't support it. And their success is superficial, those kinds of people, as he's suggesting Job is. Something easily removed and quickly forgotten. You're, you're putting your confidence in the wrong place, Job. Get back to God. And he ends with a succinct statement of retribution theology in verse 20. Behold, God will not reject a blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. Period. Right? So this is how it is. And so the solution for you is to confess and to repent. So he won't do that. He ends that. And then he has further encouragement in verses 21 and 22 for Job to repent. Though he says, he'll yet fill your mouth with laughter, your lips will be shouting, All everything's going to be good. Now, let me read you a quote. It's uh, fairly long, but it's a Tremper Longman talking about this retribution theology. And if I didn't think it'd be good for you, I wouldn't quote it to you. So, uh, here's what Longman says. The clearest heirs of Bildad's retribution theology are advocates of the so-called prosperity gospel, which proclaims that God wants to lavish health, wealth, and happiness on his faithful. Have you ever seen this? This is everywhere. Christianity is sold as kind of a marketing thing. You see, no, no, no. no. Why do you want to be a Christian? Because if you be a Christian, you get good stuff. You be protected, you live your life in a bubble, your kids be safe. Uh, okay. And so that's it. He says, sickness, poverty, and sadness, you see, are signs of what? Lack of faith. Right? Now that lasts until one of these people's kid gets cancer. You see? This is what happens. But this, is, this stuff is everywhere. He says, sickness, poverty, and sadness are signs of a lack of faith. It's a problem with you. That's the only receipt. You're getting this in retribution for some lack of yours, for sin. You don't believe enough. If you only had my kind of faith, you see, then you'd be immune. The good times would be rolling. Right? And you see that. It says, but of course, it is not just those who affirm the prosperity gospel that find affinity with the retribution theology of the friends. When adversity strikes, we all have the propensity to ask, what did I do to deserve this? The assumption is that it is sin and sin alone that leads to suffering. Now, I'm a person who thinks that when something happens, that it is okay, and I would recommend taking stock to say, is God getting my attention? Is this discipline? Okay? But I don't say then it has to be. You see, I take stock of it and say, well, no, it's not. Okay. That's a legitimate answer. It's not. I don't sit there and say, no, it has to be, it has to be. What, what did I do? Hmm, did I think about this somewhere over here? And or, you drive yourself crazy doing that. All right? So it says, the book of Job is written as a corrective to this view. 
You have to see this. This is God's message to us. And Job, this is a corrective to this nonsense that suffering only befalls people for sin. He says, uh, corrective that is view rejecting retribution theology as an explanation of Job's suffering. Although sin does lead to suffering, it does not always do so right away. See the introduction for an explanation of the biblical view that ultimate reward and punishment happen in the eschaton, happen in the eternal state. Okay? He goes on, he says, furthermore, sin is not the only explanation of suffering. Bildad's perspective depends on the idea that suffering originates only in sin. This view was shared by Jesus' disciples when they came across a man born blind. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? John 9, 2. The disciples could not imagine another possibility than that this man's affliction came from his or his parents' sin. Jesus broadens their horizon and ours by responding, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. You see, there was another alternative. It wasn't simply, well, he's getting this because somebody sinned. There was another alternative, and I say the problem for us in our suffering is that God rarely reveals to us what the reason is. And so we have to live in the ambiguity of that situation. Now, sometimes he will lift the veil. As I was saying to somebody recently, you look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the perfect man, sinless, brutalized. Now, everybody would look at that and say, that's horrible, unspeakable evil that a perfectly innocent person is butchered like that. But in that case, God lifts the veil and says, do you see what I'm doing? Do you see what I'm doing through this, this suffering that you see as unjust? But you have to understand, I have something else I'm working. Now, when you are suffering and you can't understand what I'm doing, trust that I'm doing something. Amen. Trust that I'm doing something. Even if you can't put, wrap your mind around it, even if you can't understand what I'm doing, you hold on to the fact that I am doing something because I am an, I am an absolutely holy, righteous, and loving God who gave His Son for you. Now you look at what I did and you ever think that I'm not down with you? Right? That I, that I don't love you to the point of dying for you? Don't ever think that, even if you can't understand. Right? Don't ever think that. So he says, there are many causes of suffering. Jesus' response and the book of Job reminds us not to assume that suffering is necessarily connected to sin. What is it about retribution theology that makes it so intractable? It's comforting to those who are not suffering at the moment. I think that's it. You see, I really like it. I like that idea. See, I'm, well, I'm doing all right now. You see, I'm pretty good. So it must be I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. He says, after all, it gives the semblance of control. If suffering comes about only through sin, then if I do not sin, I will not suffer. To think that we might suffer without sinning is a frightening idea. But the book of Job teaches, as does the whole Bible, when rightly understood, when texts aren't just ripped out, right? When understood in the whole scope of biblical theology, he says, but the book of Job teaches, as does the whole Bible, that we are not in control, God is. Right, so God may be doing something that we in our finite fallen minds can't perceive. Why does that surprise us? He is infinite. He is God. He's playing chess on like, you know, level 50,000. And we're down here like this. 
Right, so why would we think we can understand it? But I grant, you see, it's so difficult to live in that gap where I can't come up with some understanding of it. And his call to us is simply, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust me. You see, and I've told many times, a friend from the graduate school, Ron Burnett, he's from out here, and his wife... Uh, got an aggressive form of breast cancer. This was decades ago. And uh, she was dead in like six months. He had two small children. The next day, his mother died unexpectedly, uh, unexpectedly from a complication of surgery. And I remember Ron coming to the house church we had at that time. And he, his comment to me was, I mean, just having suffered just really uh, Roughly, it was this tough. And he said, There are times when reason doesn't reach far enough. You see, in other words, he, he understood that I'm not going to be able to piece together the divine rationale. It doesn't make any sense to me why this would happen. But I'm going to have to trust that a God who loves me enough. To have his son hang on that cross that he keeps loving me and I'm just going to have to trust that there is a rationale, a morally sufficient, loving purpose he has in allowing this to happen and I'm going to have to live in my ignorance of it. And I think that's what he was saying. So he says, it's comforting those who who are not suffering at the moment. After all, it gives a semblance of control. If suffering comes about only through sin, that if I don't sin, I will not suffer. To think that we might suffer without sinning is frightening. Book of Job teaches, I read that. Okay, as we read on in the book of Job, we'll discover the proper response to this reality. And I've kind of laid it out for you, ultimately. That's what people ask, you know, this idea, you know, yeah, I I can't believe in God because of all the suffering. I say, look, I understand that. I understand the uh, difficulty that the extent and degree of suffering, how it is difficult to square that with a absolutely loving and all-powerful God. But I also understand that this loving and all-powerful God is so much greater than I am that he can have purposes, good purposes, that I don't perceive that are beyond me. And I said, I don't simply have to rely on my speculation about that. He has shown me in the book of Job exactly that principle. He has shown me that here is this righteous sufferer who has no idea why he's suffering as he is. But he has told us there is in fact an overarching purpose that he is serving as humanity's champion in this great spiritual uh, contest. So there is this purpose, but it's not known to Job. And in your suffering, there may come times where it is not known to you. Now, I'm fine with trying to think about what could God possibly be doing. That's fine. But if we don't reach an answer that satisfies us, you still hold on to the loving God like a mad dog. Okay? Thanks. Thanks.